Okay, guys, good evening uh, and thank you for joining me for this, the, the final session, really, of this bookkeeping controls unit. Um, I hope that you'll find it useful. Um, so for those of you that haven't managed to join us before, my name's Helen and I'm one of the tutors at Premier Training. The plan for tonight, guys, is to go through the final elements of content for this unit um, and then also to perhaps have a look at some more of the AAT style questions. Um, so let's make a start. As with all the sessions, guys, the, the session will be recorded and made available to you afterwards. Um, and I'll do my very best to keep an eye on that chat. So if there's any questions as we go along, anything you'd like me to recap, um, just pop it in there and I'll do my very best to answer your queries. So guys, the aim of tonight, we're going to look at the content really for chapters five and six, which concludes this module. Um, and having done that, you will be then best placed to go ahead and have a look at assignment three. And then feeding on from that, you should then be able to have a look at the practice assessments if you haven't already. The content of tonight's session, we're going to have a look at different types of payment methods. And for a lot of you guys, that will be revision because it, it's stuff that we do from a personal point of view as well. Um, we're also going to look at what happens tonight when things go wrong. So up until now, um, we've focused on making sure our double entry is right. And of course, that should always be our objective. But invariably, guys, we're humans, we make mistakes, and it's important that when we do make mistakes or our colleagues make mistakes, we can put them right. So we're gonna have a look at errors, suspense accounts, and we're gonna look at journals and put them right this evening. And then, um, time permitting, I would like to have a look at some of the questions from an AAT paper. So I'm not gonna walk you through the whole paper, guys, but I am gonna have a go at, at talking you through perhaps some of the more complex questions there. Okay, so let's see what we're going to start off with and that's payment methods and a lot of this is really around the different types of methods that are available to a business and they're very similar to the very types of methods that we can use ourselves um, so the first one that we'll consider is a standing order and a standing order is an instruction to pay a regular amount which is due at the same time every month and the instruction to pay comes from us the account holder so this is ideal for a payment that happens on the same day of the month for the same amount. So something like your business rates, you know, your, your domestic rates. We know it comes out as a set day and it's always the same amount. The direct debit, that's very similar to a standing order. But this time round, it's established by the company who received the funds. Clearly with our authorisation, but it's established by the company who actually received the funds themselves. Um, same principle again, it's utilised for those transactions that occur on a regular basis, but sometimes when the amounts vary. So for example, um, maybe your utility bills or maybe your um, mobile phone contract, for example, we know it's going to come out, but depending on whether we've exceeded allowances, it could vary in amount. So a direct debit, useful, a transaction, we use it as individuals, businesses also use it too. Direct credit, um, and this is very similar to the BACS transactions. Um, so it's a popular method for paying our wages and our, our salaries. Um, it can also be used to transfer funds to suppliers. And guys, in essence, what happens is an electronic file gets uploaded to your financial provider. Um, it lists all the account names, the sort codes, the account codes, the amounts that you want to pay and the bank does the rest for you. So it's an effective electronic payment method that's widely used by businesses. Of course, there's more, and those include CHAPS, faster payments, and the check. Well, CHAPS are used, commonly used for large transactions. Um, so particularly when you need to guarantee funds are in a particular account at a specific day and time. Um, so maybe if you're purchasing maybe your house, for example, you know you need to get your funds with your solicitor by a set time. And consequently, guys, to do that, the CHAPS is the, the technique that is generally used. Very good. Guarantees the funds will, will be there when you need them to be. The only disadvantage is it generally comes with a cost. So your financial provider will generally charge you for doing that. OK, so there'll generally be a fee for that. Faster payment service. 
this is quite new. I'm not going to say it's very new, but it's quite new. Um, it runs alongside backs, but it makes sure that transfers of money can happen instantly between accounts. So it's a really effective tool for a business and um, particularly useful. Maybe if you're being threatened by your supplier of being put on stop, you need to make sure that the source of supply is continuous. The faster payments method will get that money into that their account instantly for you. So that's a common one. And, and there's generally no charge associated with that. So it's a, it's a nice tool to have. The check, if I'd have been doing this presentation 10, 15 years ago, was a really common payment method, but not so much today, although absolutely it's still in existence. Um, so a check is a written instruction to a bank to pay a specific amount to another person, and it's written by the bank's customer. Different banks will have different policies in terms of clearing cycles for checks, guys, but the standard one is three days. It takes three days for a check to clear. And finally, the other payment methods that I'd like us to consider are the banker's draft, the debit and the credit card. And certainly two of those I would imagine that we've, we've all come across. The banker's draft is a guaranteed check. So it's, it's similar to a normal check, but this time the customer's requested a check from the bank. The bank checks the customer's accounts, ensures there's sufficient funds there and writes the check on the customer's behalf. And because the bank are writing it, guys, it's a guaranteed check. Again, commonly used for, for high value purchases. So um, maybe you're going to buy your, your brand new car and um, you don't want to do a bank transfer. Um, they're not going to accept a personal check because it will take three days to clear, but they would accept a banker's draft there and then. Depend upon your financial provider, depends on whether you're going to have to pay for that privilege. So that's just something to be mindful of with a banker's draft. And I don't know about you guys, but I don't know where I'd be without my debit card. You know, very rarely do I carry cash. Everything is paid on my, on my card. Um, and particularly, it's now even more convenient because there's apps on your phone and, and even on your watch now that you can make those payments. Um, as soon as that payment is made, guys, it, it impacts your bank account instantly so your, your funds are committed instantly and um, so really flexible tool really really commonly used businesses will also have debit cards they'll issue out to certain um, maybe sales people and uh, maybe people on the road as perhaps credit cards the credit cards are slightly different but they're particularly effective for um, use of online transactions because they get well that there's an added level of security there um, generally the cardholder will pay for those purchases the following month. Um, you can take longer, but obviously if you take longer, the bank will charge you interest. So the recommendation is by all means use credit cards, but most businesses will clear those balances on a monthly basis to avoid incurring any additional costs. And in terms of the exam guys, you'll be presented with a few scenarios and you'll be asked to match the most appropriate form of payment method. And we're going to have a look at one of those questions later in the session. But really, the majority of, of items we've discussed there should be quite familiar to you because you'll have come across them, if not in a working capacity, certainly from a personal point of view as well. OK, guys, just checking you all OK. You're still with me and um, you, you need me to recap anything. Are, are you all good? Uh, and if you are, we'll move on to uh, trial balances. Great guys, thank you ever so much. Okay, so now let's consider perhaps probably the more complex aspect of this unit. In your first unit, Introduction to Bookkeeping Transactions, you did a lot of work on the trial balance and you took great satisfaction from totaling your debits and credits and making sure they agreed. And because if they did agree, you had security that you collected the marks, you'd done everything right. And that's when that huge sense of relief came in. The debits, the credits, they, they agree. The 53,750 gave you confidence that all along your double entry had taken place and all along everything was okay. I'm gonna tell you something slightly different now in this unit because the trial balance, a balanced trial balance, proves that mathematically no errors have been made. And when I say mathematically, I mean the debits and credits so it proves that your debits and credits have agreed. 
okay? It doesn't prove you've done all your debits and credits right, but mathematically, the trial balance that balances shows that all along, all your transactions have agreed, your debits and credits have worked. But a balanced trial balance can still have errors, which probably horrifies you because you've been told all along, balance your trial balance and you're okay. And at that introduction to bookkeeping, guys, that's absolutely right. That's exactly what you should have done. But at this level, what we need to appreciate is that a balanced trial balance can still contain errors. Those errors are harder to spot because of the very nature of them. They're not obvious to us. And they tend to be spotted with experience. So depending on what your job role is, your job role may be to take a trial balance and produce a set of financial statements. And when you start to prepare those statements and you start to do analysis work on those statements, the figures won't feel right because by experience, you'll have an expectation of what the numbers should be. And through that experience, it will cause you to question certain balances. So we need to understand that there'll be different types of errors that will impact the trial balance. But I firstly want to talk to you about the type of errors that will exist in your work, that will exist in the trial balance, but still mean that your trial balance balances. So all along, we need to focus on this slide. We need to focus on the fact that double entry has taken place. Debits and credits have still happened. Let's look at the first error. The first error is something called an error of admission. And guys, what that means is a transaction has been completely missed from the accounts. So maybe I've received an invoice from my supplier and I just haven't put it into my records. Maybe I've issued a credit note to my customer. I haven't put it in. So my trial balance will still balance, but my debits and credits just didn't happen. So in the example of my purchase invoice, my purchases will be undercast. So will my payables ledger control account but my trial balance will still work because nothing happened, neither debits or credits took place. Reversal of entries. So this is where your debits and credits have been entered, but the wrong way around. So for example, maybe I've got an invoice of a thousand pounds for a cleaning bill. You know that the double entry for that is to debit cleaning and to credit the bank. When I process the transaction, I debited the bank and I credited cleaning, which is clearly wrong. But that error will not be disclosed by the trial balance because my debits and credits agreed. My thousand pound debits and credits took place. My trial balance will still balance. Whenever you correct a reversal of entries, and this may be worth noting for later on this evening, but whenever you correct a reversal of entries, guys, you must always double the figure. And that's a common mistake students forget to do because if you just do the the um correction to the, the thousand pound all you'll do is you'll zero both accounts so you'll just remove the the, um, the incorrect error what you need to do is remove the incorrect error and post the correction so a reversal of entries your debits and credits have taken place the wrong way around and when you correct them you'll double the figure up okay and we'll see an example of that in a, in a while an error of commission. So this is where the transaction has been recorded, but just in the wrong account. Um, so sticking with my example of my cleaning invoice, um, I know that I should have debited cleaning and I should have credited the bank. I credited the bank, but I debited wages. My debits and credits still took place. My debits and the credits still agreed. My trial balance will still agree, but my wages account will be too high. My cleaning account will be too low. And you'll only uncover that problem, guys, when you start doing some analysis on expenditure. Another error is the error of principal. And this is sometimes confused with the error of commission. But this means that a transaction has been entered in the wrong type of account. Um, so, for example, let's say that your, your, one of your sales reps has gone and had their uh, car serviced and MOT'd and it's cost them £200. When you've entered that transaction in your accounts, you have debited motor vehicles and you have credited the bank. Well, guys, an MOT and a service is an expense to your business and therefore it should be debited to a motor vehicle expense account or a motor vehicle running account. 
it shouldn't be debited to the asset account. So the error of principle is when you've used the wrong type of account. So in that example, I used an asset account rather than an expense account. Again, your trial balance will still work because your debits and credits still took place, but just not the right debits and credits. Error of original entry. So again, let's let's go back to my um, thousand pound cleaning invoice. Um, I've used the correct accounts, but I've used the incorrect amounts. So maybe I have debited 100 and I've credited 100. I've just missed the zero off. But because I did it on both the debit and the credit, my debits and credits still work. My double entry still balances. My trial balance will still agree. And the last one, I'll mention it, but I'll be honest and say in my working career, um, both in, in practice and in education, I've never come across this. Um, it, it, it's, it's an error that um, it involves basically two separate errors that have occurred in the same period for the same amount. Now, there's got to be a lot of coincidence there, guys. And as I said, I've, I've never seen one in practice, um, but it's something you have to have an awareness of for the assessment. Um, so an example of this could be maybe the, both the sales returns, which are naturally a debit account, and the purchase returns, which are naturally a credit account, may have been overcast by the same value in the same period. Um, unlikely, guys, that's going to happen, to be honest with you. Um, but it could, and it's something you certainly have to have an awareness of. All the errors on that, that slide, and that will take a bit to get used to, that will take a bit to familiarise yourself with, but all the errors on that slide mean double entry has taken place. Debits and credits have taken place. Debits and credits have agreed. And because of that, your trial balance will agree. So mathematically, when you add up your debits and your credit column, you'll agree, you'll think you're happy. But there's errors in the numbers. And those errors will come to light because of further analysis work on some of the figures, maybe when you're doing your bank reconciliation. But they will come to light, guys, but generally a little bit later down the line. So what happens when debits and credits don't work? What happens when there's a breakdown? Well, when there's a breakdown in double entry, it means my debits and credits haven't agreed and therefore I create a suspense account. And a suspense account is a holding account, which enables me to put the value of the error, the value of the difference. So when you total up your debits and you total up your credits, if double entry has broken down and debits and credits haven't agreed, one column will be higher or lower than the other. Yeah, they won't agree. The difference you can place in a suspense account temporarily, and that allows the trial balance to agree. Now, guys, I cannot stress the word temporary enough. Um, there's no place in your financial statements for a suspense account. Your auditors will be all over that value because I want to make sure that you're, you're on top of your figures, you're on top of your transactions, you're aware of errors, and you're correcting them in a timely manner. A suspense account is fine to enable us to go away and investigate the problem, identify it and correct it, but it needs to be a temporary measure. OK, suspense account is there to help us just overcome an error, just overcome a problem. So the type of errors that will be disclosed by the trial balance will result because double entry is broken down and these errors will create us a suspense account. Single entry transactions. Now, this should be quite hard to do if you're operating a computerised accounting software package, guys, because there should be controls in place that don't permit you to post a debit or credit. OK, but if you're doing this as a manual exercise and your phone rings or your colleague um, gets in touch, then absolutely you could have a problem. So in these type of errors, guys, you've made the debit entry, but you haven't made the credit. OK, so the debit entry has been made, but no credit entry has occurred. OK. In that example, your double entry has broken down and your error will be disclosed by the trial balance. We could have recorded two debits or two credits for a transaction. And in that instance, guys, the double entry won't work the double entry has broken down. OK, so in that situation, your trial balance won't agree. A suspense account will be created and it will need to be investigated and your suspense account cleared.
The other type of error that exists is when we've recorded different amounts. So guys, in this example, let's go back to my cleaning invoice. I have debited cleaning of a thousand pounds, but I've credited it for a hundred. So guys, in that situation, I'm gonna have a problem. In that situation, my double entry has broken down and a suspense account will be created, okay? Easily done. Again, in a computerized accounting system, it shouldn't happen because there should be controls in place. But in a manual system, guys, it absolutely could happen. And then the last one, which could happen, um, again, because there's just so much data to deal with, is an omission error. So this is where you've made all your double entry, your double entries taken place, it, it's been correct. But when you've transferred your ledger balances into the trial balance, you've missed one. Okay, so part of the double entries in your trial balance, but part of it isn't. And consequently, in that instance, the errors are existing, the debits and credits haven't worked, the trial balance won't agree, a suspense account is required. So all of the errors on that slide, guys, are going to cause you a problem with your double entry. All of those errors means debits and credits haven't agreed. And when debits and credits don't agree, a suspense account is required. Let's have a look at an example now of when that could exist. So we're told that a payment for heat and light of £1,218 has been correctly recognised in the expense account, but no further entries were made. OK, let's read that again. A payment for heat and light of £1,218 has been correctly recognised in the expense account. So the debit was made, but no further entries have been made. Guys, your thoughts, please. Will my trial balance balance? Yes or no. As a result of that, will my trial balance balance? Yes or no. Lovely. Absolutely, guys, you've got it. Yeah, spot on. No, you're right. Because my double entry hasn't worked. And guys, I like to think about double entry as a set of weighing scales. And for me, those weighing scales need to be perfectly aligned for everything to be OK. And they're not aligned, guys, that they're a bit wonky. And when I've got wonky scales, it means my double entry's broken down. And when my double entry's broken down, a suspense account will be created. The suspense account is going to temporarily allow the trial balance to, to work. And then I can clear it once I've identified the error. In this question, guys, the debit entry was made there was no credit. So when I totaled my trial balance, the credit side was too light. So I would then create a suspense account with a trial balance difference of £1,218. That can't stay there. I need to get rid of it. And the key to this exam, the key to this assessment is getting rid of those errors, understanding when a suspense account is required and how to deal with it. Some of you guys, I have every confidence that you'll be able to deal with it quite competently without really much effort and thought. But, you know, for some students, this is a real sort of a learning challenge. And it's not necessarily the case that you don't have the knowledge or the skills to do it. It's sometimes the confidence to deal with these questions, guys. So if that's you, if you're sat there thinking, mm, I'm not sure, if that's you, we can use three steps. And those three steps will really help us overcome the problem. We're going to look at what did, what should, and how to correct it. Okay, so what did, what should, and the correction. In terms of what did happen, guys, we're going to get that from the question. And you were told in the question that a payment of heat and light for 1218 has been correctly recognised in the suspense account. So the debit happened but no further entries happened. So in terms of what did, that's what did happen, guys. 
I debited heat and light and I didn't credit anywhere. So in that scenario, I have a breakdown of double entry. And guys, you've already told me that that's going to cause me a problem with my trial balance. My trial balance won't agree. And you've told me that I need a suspense account. And you're absolutely right. I did and I have. What should have happened? We get that from our knowledge. We get that from our introduction to bookkeeping transactions knowledge, our first unit. We know that when we make a payment for um, expenses, we debit expenses and we credit the bank. OK. The correction, and this is where, where people struggle. It's just having the confidence to look at the question, guys, and, and, and pull out the, the information you need. We should have debited heat and light, and we did. So, guys, we can forget that transaction. The heat and light account, the expense account is fine. But we should have credited the bank, and we didn't. And a lot of the time, students sometimes aren't necessarily confident when they do or don't need a suspense account as part of the correction if that's you yeah if that's you the answer to the simple answer to that is did you have double entry in your first scenario in the did scenario because if you didn't a suspense account will form part of the correction and in this question guys i need to credit the bank with 1218 and i need to debit suspense and in doing that i put the right entry in my bank account and my suspense account is now clear. And that is what I need to happen because remember what I said, there is no place in the final accounts for a suspense account. The suspense account temporarily is a measure to help you overcome an issue, to help you balance your trial balance, but the error needs to be identified and corrected, which is what we've done here. The what did, should, and the correction technique, guys, is really quite straightforward, it gives you structure, with structure comes confidence and with confidence comes marks. So I'm hoping that will give you some sort of tool um, in terms of, of how you tackle these questions going forward. It comes with practice and there's lots of excellent resources available to help you with that, guys. And of course, you know, if there's anything I can clarify you further on that for you, then please don't hesitate to get in touch. Um, as always, my contact details will be at the end of this PowerPoint. Guys, are you OK? Are you still with me? Any questions before we, we move on to the next section? Fabulous, thank you. If anything does come up, guys, and anything you're not sure of, then please don't hesitate to, to drop me a message or contact your tutor. You know, we're all here to help you. What I'd like to spend some time doing now is looking at some of the more complex questions of an AAT paper. So guys, this is a 90 minute assessment, um, so I'm not gonna keep you for an hour and a half, panic not. Um, I'm not gonna go through every single uh, question on an AAT paper, but I would like to just talk you through some of the, the more complex questions and give you a few strategies in terms of coping with those and, and things to, to look out for or to watch for. Um, just let me have a quick look at that, Luke, at the details of it. Yeah, so the um, so the details for the so in terms of your question, Luke. So the details for the credit into the bank, um, it w so when we when we make the entry into the bank account, we would put the name of the opposite entry. So in that example, it will be suspense. Yeah. So when we're making that entry, we always we always use opposites. So whenever we debit a, a, an account, we use the narrative as where the credit entry is sitting. Okay. So it's always the narratives are always the opposite account where the debit or the credit is sitting respectively. So guys, the AAT practice assessment is going to pull together the content from the last three sessions. So we looked at control accounts. We've looked at methods of payments. In fact, we've done that this evening. We've looked at cash book and bank reconciliations, journals, errors and suspense accounts. So all we need to do, and this, I'm making this sound really simple, is put all that together and apply our knowledge. But guys, there's practice assessments available on our platform, which are excellent revision, revision tools, and you'll get really good feedback. There's additional sample assessments on the AAT website, and I'm going to talk you through some of those quick questions tonight. But there's lots of resources available to you. Utilise them, guys, before you go in for that assessment. You stand the best possible a chance of getting a positive outcome if you do. 
So task one, and this really reflects back on our session one, because in session one, I looked at control accounts with you. And I do apologise that the, the text on this is quite small, guys. Um, it literally is a copy and, and pasting from the AAT paper. But in this question, you're told by your line manager that the credit balance on the VAT control at the end of February was 3,800. The credit balance at the end of January was 8,710. And you've been asked to prepare a VAT control account to explain why the February balance is lower. But actually, in terms of the exam, guys, what you're actually asked to do is just populate that VAT control. And we did something very similar in session one. It's really understanding the purpose of that VAT control account and making sure we understand what goes where. Well, let's take a moment, guys, and think about the VAT control account. The purpose of it is to establish whether we owe HMRC or indeed a refund is due from HMRC. So we've got some figures to map in, opening balances and closing balances to map in. Let's see how we get on. We're preparing the account for February. So the first thing we have to do, deal with is the opening balance. And you're told that the credit balance at the end of January was £8,710. But if that was the credit balance at the end of January, guys, it's also going to be the balance at the start of February. And that the key thing for these guys is the figures that you're given are opening balances. They're your balance brought downs. OK, so 8710 is owing to HMRC at the beginning of the period. I'm now going to look at the closing balance. And I know that feels a bit odd because normally we put the closing balance at the bottom of the control account. In terms of this exercise, guys, it doesn't matter. The key is making sure you get it on the right side. And this is where potentially... Um, some students may, may struggle slightly with this, this next bit. It says that the credit balance on the VAT control account at the end of February was 3,800. I'm going to stress now that is given as a balance bought down figure. Okay, it's given as a balance bought down, but we're treating it as a balance carried down. And therefore, when we're given the balance bought down as a credit figure, it will translate to a debit figure as a balance carry down of 3,800, okay? So it's on, the, it's on the debit side, guys, because whilst in the question it was given as a balance bought down, we're treating it as a balance carried down. The VAT on sales, this is a liability that's not our money. It goes to HMRC and we'll sit on the credit side to increase the liability. The VAT on purchases, we can reclaim it. Let's reduce the liability by popping it on the debit side. The VAT on sales returns, guys, will reduce the liability and therefore is a debit entry. Equally, the VAT on purchase returns reduces the value of the VAT reclaimable and therefore is a credit. We've got a similar theme going on now, guys, of discount allowed and discount received the VAT on both of those. The VAT on your discount allowed reduces the original liability. The VAT on discount received reduces the VAT that's reclaimable. That £150, guys, for cash sales, that's not our cash. We need to pay it to HMRC and therefore we pop it on the credit side of the account. And the payment or the receipt from HMRC sometimes confuses students. So the way to think about this is the payment made to HMRC is funds leaving our business. So we know double entry has to agree and take place. A payment would mean a credit to the bank and a debit through the VAT control account. The debit through the VAT control account reduces the liability we have. OK. If you were due a refund from HMRC, guys, then the refund would sit on the credit side of the VAT control account because the money coming in would be debited through the bank to increase the bank asset and credited through the VAT control to reduce the um, refund amount, the asset amount that we're due. Now, this is where, guys, you're going to get some confidence and you're going to collect some marks already because if we've done this correctly, your debits and credits will agree. So I'd like you to check, do they agree? And if they do, what figure do they agree on, guys? I'll give you a moment just to get your calculator out and, and just check that for me. So what is the figure that they agree on if they agree? Yeah, fingers crossed they do.
Excellent, Luke. Spot on. Well done. Yeah, I'll just give it a, a, anyone else a moment that's also working through that. Excellent, guys. And this is where you know you get confidence when you're going through that this this exam paper because in the live assessment if this is something that you get guys you know if you've balanced off your vat control this is this is confidence you've collected those marks so it's a nice feeling and it's particularly a nice taster for the first task of the the paper well done let's still stick with task one and let's have a look another aspect GAL Limited has the following receivables ledger control and all you're asked to do is provide what the balance carried down figure is on this account guys this is something you'd have done copious amounts of time in your first module what is the balance carried down guys what do I owe or what do my customers owe me at the end of this period pop it in the chat when you've got the figure for me lovely oh, we're all in harmony guys which is fabulous absolutely so what, what did you do well you'd have totaled up the debits and the credits you'd have taken the one away from the other and you'd have found the difference of 28 890 wonderful guys well done guys that's a simple one mark question but all these marks count all these marks go into securing that competent grade Task two is still sticking with the same theory in terms of controlled accounts. So still reflecting back on our first session, lesson one. We're told the following suppliers report has been provided at the end of the month. And then you're told that if the payables ledger control account reconciles with the payables ledger, what will the balance be? Guys, it is. Okay, so guys, what we're going to do now is we're going to, I'm going to ask you to verify the figure on the payables ledger. And I'm going to ask you just to check that for me. So add up all those supplier accounts, those are in the payables ledger. How much guys, how much do my suppliers collectively, how much do they owe me? And I'll just give you a moment to do that. So I've got a number of supplier accounts. All these supplier accounts I owe money to. They're my liabilities. I want to know collectively what's the figure. How much? How much do I owe them? How much is my business exposed by? Excellent, guys. Well done. Yeah, so easy, isn't it? Just to, to, to transpose um, a figure. Absolutely. It's, it's so easy to do so. But 55,992 is absolutely the correct figure. Guys, one to watch out for there is sometimes they'll, they'll just throw red herrings into the scenario for you. So one to watch out for is, you know, your supplier should all be credit balances because they're liabilities, because we owe them money. But sometimes there'll be an instance where maybe you've overpaid them for whatever reason. And sometimes you'll be told that there's a debit balance in there. Well, if there is a debit balance in there, guys, then that figure needs to be deducted. So just, just be mindful of that. 
if you're not told, like in this question, you're absolutely right just to, to calculate them all together and that's fine. But just watch out for if you're told there's a debit balance in your supplier um, balances or there's a credit balance in your receivable balances. Um, it just is trying to throw you off the scent. It's just trying to trip you up. Don't fall for that one, guys. OK, now we need to make a note of that number because we're going to do something else with it now. So 55992 is the magic number. That's the balance of our payables ledger. The balance on the control account, though, is 55,261. And what you're asked to do is to complete the following statement. It says the payables ledger control is an amount and the options, guys, are less than or more than. OK, so I've presented a little table there and I've pulled the 55992 from the previous slide. You know what the balance is on the control account. Guys, what is the difference? And is the payables control account more than or less than the payables ledger? OK. Lovely. Perfect, guys. Yeah, absolutely. We're all singing for, from that same sheet. Okay, it's two marks, guys. And, you know, I know you may think, yeah, but it's only two marks. Yeah, but two marks add up and two marks become four and four become six. And suddenly we get ourselves a, a competent grade and a positive outcome. So tasks one and two on the paper aren't, aren't anything to concern yourself with. The last part of this, and this is something we looked at in lesson one, and, and I openly said it's not a common um, a common task between students, is when you're given balances on the control account and the um, receivables ledger or the payables ledger, depending on what you're looking at, and then you're asked to identify what could have caused that error. And guys, the reason this isn't popular is because there's not a mathematical solution to this. Okay, I can't add up some figures and then agree to a figure. I have to use my knowledge and I have to apply that knowledge. And if you were there with me, if you were able to join me for session one, you'd have seen me just map out a little table and I've mapped in the balance for the receivables ledger and I've been told that's 85,382. And the balance on the control account is 87,786. And I've worked my difference out. So either my receivables ledger needs to increase or my payables ledger needs to reduce. OK, so we're going to go through these five options now and we're going to look at does it satisfy what we need? Does it increase the receivables ledger? Does it reduce the control account? And hopefully that will give us the strategy to be able to deal with this question. So the first one, a sale to a customer was missed from the list of individual balances when totaling the receivables ledger. So a sale to a customer was missed from the list of individual balances when totaling the receivables ledger. Well, guys, if that was the case, the receivables ledger would increase. And that's what I want to happen. So that's definitely an option that may explain the difference. I'm then told that a sales invoice has been recorded in the receivables ledger twice well if that's the case when that duplicate invoice is removed the receivables ledger will reduce and that can't be right guys because i need my receivables ledger to increase and that doesn't explain the difference i'm then told that a cash sale has not been recorded well guys a cash sale has no impact on the receivables ledger or the control account. So that's a red herring. It's there to trip you up. Don't let it. It can't explain the difference, guys. I had to really think about this one. When I was preparing this, I, I, you know, I had to think about this for a moment or two. And it says a transposition error has been made when initially recording a sale in the day book. Well, a transposition error, guys, as you know, is just when we muddle our numbers up. OK, so we use the same numbers, but we present them in a different order. So potentially, could, could it could it explain the difference? And the reason we know it doesn't is because a transposition error is evenly divisible by nine. 
So meaning, guys, if I divide my difference of 2404 by 9, I should get an even number. And it doesn't. I think if you were to do it, guys, I think it gives you something like 267.111 recurring. And because of that rule, the transposition rule, the divisible by 9 rule, it can't be the reason for the difference. But that took a while to think about, guys. Okay. So a transposition error has been made when initially recording the sale. Uh, if it was recorded in the day, but wouldn't it affect both the ledger uh, and the control? Um, generally, um, Jenny, generally what we say is, yeah, you're right in principle there. You are right in principle. So in effect, it could, it could impact both. Um, but generally saying these type of questions, whenever there's a problem with a day book, there's a problem with the um, the control account. Um, so that that's generally the way we would look at it. But absolutely, you're right, you know, because in, in the individual lines, they would both go through um, into the, uh, you know, the subsidiary ledger, the receivables ledger. Okay. And then the last one is a discount allowed to a customer, and that's been recorded twice in the individual customer. So think about this. A discount allowed reduces the balance. OK, if a discount allowed has gone in twice, then that balance in the customer's account has been reduced too much. So when we remove one of the entries, the receivables ledger will increase. So that could be the difference for the error. Okay. Guys, it's five marks. And I said to you when we did session one, this isn't a task you're going to spend 40 to 50 minutes on. However, it is certainly a task you're going to spend five, six, seven minutes on. And certainly a task through process of elimination and just understanding which balances need to increase will help and hopefully get you some marks. Let's have a look at task three. Now, task three hopefully will be quite fresh because it was something we did at the start of this um, this evening session. So we've got four types of transactions, four scenarios. And all I want us to do, guys, is I want us to understand what type of transaction, what type of method is most appropriate. So a method of making the same regular payment directly from the bank account. And the key word there is the same regular payment. Well guys, what do you think? <clears throat> Great. Absolutely guys. Yeah, it's a certainly a standing order. The same regular amount. Well done. What about a payment made by card? And that payment immediately impacts my bank account. Yeah, lovely. And you can see, guys, can't you? You know, if you've got your online banking app on your phone, you can go into a shop and you instantly come out of that shop and you can see the transactions there. Lovely. What about a signed written order to a bank to transfer a specific amount of money? Lovely. Excellent. Not as common, guys, as what it used to be, but no doubt it still exists. Well done. Perfect. And then the last one is a method of making regular payments from a bank account, but the amounts can vary. You're there before I am. Well done. It certainly is. It's a direct debit. Well done. Perfect. And so, guys, you know, how is the, tonight's context assessed nothing more complicated than that and all of those items really we're familiar with because we've come across them and um, certainly if, if not in our professional capacity in, in our personal one task four it's a bit more involved task four is so task four reflects back on what we did last week which is lesson two and it looks at a bank reconciliation now if you remember last week we talked at length really about the five steps that are involved in that process okay so the first step and we're going to do this tonight the first step is to agree the opening balances so guys i can clearly see and i'll just put a little red dot there so you can see 
the only balances don't work how much buy guys how much are they out by perfect yeah so we're all unanimous we agree it's 556 step one is to agree those opening balances we can't proceed until we do now the problem we have guys is 556 is not easily visible on my bank statement which is the document on the right i said to you last week that that transaction you'll see the difference and it will be somewhere near the top part of the bank statement because the difference is from a timing difference from last period and as I said, in the real world, we'd have our bank reconciliation from last period to be able to identify those transactions. But we don't have that in the exam. So we're having to play a mathematical game, guys. We're having to look at the figures and try and work out what combination of payments in and payments out come to our difference of 556. Guys, the payment in of, of 986 less the payment out of 1300. Well, that doesn't work because that gives me a negative value. So it can't be that. The combination of 899 less 1300, again, I've got the same problem there. It, it can't be that. Yeah, absolutely. So the combination of 986 less the payment of 430, it does the job, doesn't it? It gives me the 556. Five, so in this question, guys, it's not one figure that makes up the difference, but it's two. It's a payment in, less a payment out. So when I cross off and agree my opening balances, I'm going to highlight all four. Because if you don't, you will end up updating those items into your cash book and that will give you a problem later down the line. Guys, I'm just going to take a step back on that one and just, just retort you through that because it's so important we get that right. You told me they didn't agree and they didn't agree by £556. That difference will be on the bank statement. It wasn't quite as easy to identify as, as the activity we did last week, but we can play around with the payments in and the payments out. And you guys clearly did to come up with the difference being the payment in of 986 less the payment out of 430. So when I agree my opening balances, all four transactions are going to be highlighted. The two opening balances and the payment in and out. Step two is to tick off the items that appear in both. So I'm going to work tonight, guys. I'm going to work down the debit side of my cash book. So on the debit side of my cash book, I have a payment in of 899. I'm going to cross that off. It's in both. I can see the 1100 is in both as is the 2,300. Guys, I can't see that payment in for 999 from Khan, so I need to bear that in mind in a while. On the credit side of my cash book, this records money leaving the business, I can see the 1,300. That's there, it's in both, I'm crossing it off. I can't see the payment for 210 pounds for AFG, so I need to bear that in mind and come across that later. But I can say the 1,190, I'm going to cross that off. And that's step two, guys. You've agreed the items that are in both and I've highlighted them in blue. Step three is to update the cash book. But guys, like last week, I don't have room. I don't have additional lines on my cash book to be able to do that. But I am presented with a template at the bottom left hand corner of the slide and that's my updating item. So the items that are on my bank statement, I'm now going to put into this template to give me a revised cash book figure. And guys, this is different to the layout that we saw last week, but the layout shouldn't matter. It's the steps that matter and the steps don't change. So step three, no, I can't put it in my cash book, but I can put it in my adjustment. So in the bottom left hand side of the screen, guys, you can see you've got a little box and it states that the closing balance on the cash book is 8586. 
and you can see that's the balance carried down in the cash book. So the three items that I've not yet ticked off in my bank statement needs to go into here. And obviously, guys, the payments out will go in as credits. The payments in will go in as debits. So I'm going to transfer the £154 to the credit side of this template. The bank charges payment of £12 is going to go on the credit side. And you can see, guys, I'm highlighting them off my bank uh, statement just so I know I've dealt with them. And, and I've got a payment in for £580 and naturally that will go on the debit side. And that's the end of step three, updating the cash book with the items that are on the bank statement. And th those guys will be transactions that we may have been aware of, but we may just not have necessarily known the amount of until they hit. Certainly that will be the case for bank charges. We may know we were going to incur some fees. We may just not necessarily know the value. So guys, step four is to calculate a new balance carried down on the cash book. So the closing balance of 8586, less the two payments of 154 and 12 pounds, adding on the receipt of 580, what is the new figure of the cash book, guys? What is the balance carried down of the cash book? Perfect. Excellent, guys. £9,000, it certainly is. Yeah, well done, guys. So £9,000 is hopefully what our bank statement balances on, closes on. Well, we don't live in an ideal world, do we, guys? We certainly don't. If you look at the bottom of your bank statement, the bottom of your total column on your bank statement, it says it's £8,211. So I now need to complete step five by doing a bank rec. And the bank rec is going to identify the timing differences. And remember last week, the purpose of the, the bank rec is to identify the timing differences, not to get rid of them, but just to identify them so we understand them. So we're going to take the closing balance as per the bank statement of 8211. We're going to add in the outstanding lodgement from Khan of 999. We're going to take off the 210 unpresented check of AFG. And that's going to give me an adjusted closing balance of how much, guys? Great stuff. And I'll just pause and give you a moment just to make sure you're all happy. So 8211, add on the outstanding lodgement, take off the unpresented cheque, gives me a revised figure. And hopefully, if we've done it right, that revised figure will agree to the balance carried down I calculated as per the cash book. And guys, you're telling me it does. Let's see. It certainly does. And guys, that's the figure, that's the magic number I need. And that gives me confidence that I've collected the marks of this task. And I said to you last week that with practice, this is a nice task to have in the exam because it, it's something that you can work with and you can secure the marks and know that you have before you move on. The five steps are the key. The opening balance agreement, the identification of the items that are in both, updating the cash book, with the items from the bank statement, finding a new balance carried down on the cash book, and finally, step five, completing the bank rec. Well done, guys. Task five. Well, this reflects back on what we did last week. In the start of last week's session, we looked at journals, and we're told here that an invoice has been outstanding for more than six months and that Simon wishes to write stuff as irrecoverable. So you're given an invoice and you're asked to complete the journal. And the journal template is given to you guys. So I want to debit £380 to what account? What account will I debit £380 to, guys? 
any ideas I'm going to debit 380 which is the value of the goods but to what account great Luke well done Perfect. I'm debiting 380 to my recoverable debt account. It's an expense account, guys. So I need to record the fact that I've sold goods for the value of 380 and I'm not going to receive the funds for. I'll do the next one. That's relatively straightforward. So I'll debit the VAT of 76 because I can reclaim it. Where will I credit then? I know my journal has to balance because if I don't, it's going to cause me a suspense account. So I need to credit what amount and to what account. Guys, we clearly know our stuff about irrecoverable debts. Excellent. Well done. I'm going to credit the receivables ledger control account with £456. Well done. Absolutely. That £456, guys, is going to reduce my asset of receivables because my customers are no longer going to pay me for that value. And uh, yeah, there was a, a comment. I think, Luke, you, you made a comment that I also need to do the individual account. You're absolutely right. I would. Yeah. In the in the receivables ledger, there'd need to be an entry into that account. Generally, in the exam, you're only asked to deal with the general ledger accounts. But absolutely knowledge of that is key so well done guys excellent and guys that's task five in essence so nothing could too complicated in terms of that task six is focusing on the content that we've done tonight and it asks us to understand the errors that will and won't be disclosed and historically guys people don't like these questions again because it's not not necessarily clear cut it's not a mathematical solution the key to it is understanding what the column headings mean. So disclosed by the trial balance means debits and credits don't agree. There is a breakdown in double entry. So disclosed by the trial balance means when you made your double entry, your debits and your credit credits didn't work. Not disclosed means that there's probably an error, but it's not going to be evident with the trial balance because the trial balance will still work and debits and credits still took place. OK, let's read the two options and see what we think. Dimesh made us a cash sale for £180. He put the cash into his wallet and completely forgot to record the sale in the accounts. Guys, will my trial balance work or not? So will it be disclosed or not? Very good. Excellent, guys. Quick off the mark there. Yeah, well done. Yeah, it's not right, is it? You know, my <laughs> absolutely, Kathy's very naughty. Um, but you know, it's not right, is it? The, the accounts are going to be having data that's admitted. Um, admitted. My trial balance will still work. My debits and credits will still agree. I've just got an error of admission. Let's assume it was a genuine error, but maybe it wasn't. Let's assume it was. Yeah. Um, okay. So perfect. And then Sally made a transposition error when entering the opening balances into the new accounting system. She entered the non-current asset balance as 9840, but it should have been 9480. So she's muddled her figures up. So will that, won't it be disclosed? Superb. Well done. It certainly will. Because half the double entry when she's inputted the opening balance is being done correct. But the other half, she's got a little bit muddled with her numbers. So the debits and credits won't quite, quite agree. Well done. Key really, guys, is focusing on the, the, those column headings and understanding what they mean. Disclosed, there's a breakdown in double entry. Debits and credits haven't taken place. A suspense account is required. Not disclosed. It's not right. There's an error. But the double entry still occurred. Let's look at task six now. 
and this is a little bit more complicated a little bit more involved so this business sells party bags for children's birthday parties they operate a manual accounting system and have prepared a trial balance at the end of the year the trial balance shows debits of 19,876 and credits of 24,854. So the purpose of the suspense account is to temporarily balance the trial balance. So in this example, you can clearly see debits are lighter than the credits. So you know the balance on the suspense account will be a debit, but how much? What's the difference, guys? Well done. It is, so the balance on the suspense account is not 4978 as you've quite rightly agreed. And it's a debit balance because it's the debit side that's too light. So I need to temporarily create myself a suspense account with a debit balance of 4978. Temporarily, my trial balance will agree. But the question goes a step further and it says that the following errors have been identified. So we need to correct them which can be quite a daunting task, but the question is quite, quite kind to us because it gives us a template and it tells us that we need two two-line journals and it tells us the values of the journal. So all we have to concern ourselves with is the accounts that we're debiting and crediting. And some of you will look at it and instantly be able to go away and do it without any, any problem at all. Some of you, again, not because of uh, knowledge or understanding, just because of pure confidence, won't feel comfortable doing that. So let's have a look at my did and my should scenario. Error one says that the total on the sales day book at the end of February was £2,498. When processing this total to the general ledger, Paul credited both the sales account and the receivables ledger control. We've clearly got a problem. So what did happen, guys, I've got that from the question. We credited the receivables ledger control. We credited sales. Is this going to cause me a problem with the suspense account, guys? Have I got an issue here with the suspense account? Is that part the reason for the suspense account? Yes or no? Absolutely. Because double entry hasn't occurred. There's been a breakdown in my double entry. What should have happened... Well, we get that from our knowledge and we know that when we debit, um, when we uh, make a sale, we debit the receivables ledger control and we credit sales. This is what we talked about earlier, guys. There's a partial reversal entry here because half the double entry has gone in the wrong way around. OK, so that receivables ledger control should have been a debit. OK should have been the debit to increase the asset. My sales account is fine. So I've put a line through that. It's okay, I can ignore it. But I need to record the sale in the receivables ledger. So I'm going to debit my receivables ledger control account with 2,498. Is that the figure, guys? Yeah, absolutely spot on. I need to double it because if I just do it with 2498, I'll clear the error, but I won't post the correct error and more importantly, clear the suspense account. Well done. So the, the correction, guys, is I need to debit the receivables ledger control and credit the suspense and doubling it quite rightly to remove the incorrect entry and put the right one in. Error two states that in March... Paul paid an invoice for electricity. He correctly credited the cash book with 124, but he recorded this debit in the electricity expense account as 142. So again, let's have a look at the did and the should. I did debit electricity with 142, and I credited the cash book, the bank, with 124. Guys, does this cause me a problem in terms of my suspense account? Absolutely. Well done. 
It certainly does. And the reason it does, guys, is because double, en double entry didn't take place. Debits and credits didn't agree. What should I have done? Guys, what should I have done for that transaction? I'm going to make you think and work tonight. So what should have happened? What should have been the double entry for that? Yeah. Putting you on the spot, guys. Lovely. Absolutely, guys, you've got it. Spot on. I should have debited electricity with 124 and I should have credited cash book with 124. My cash book's okay. Yeah, I can forget that so I don't have to worry about the bank. That's okay. It's been dealt with as it should have been. But my electricity account, guys, is too high and it's too high by £18. And therefore, guys, to correct it, I need to reduce my electricity. And I'm not sure where the opposite entry goes. So, guys, Anyone feel brave enough to have a go at where that, that entry is? So what debit and what credit would I need to correct error two? And don't worry if you're not sure. Yep, Luke, spot on. Yep, absolutely. So we're crediting electricity. We're reducing electricity. We overstated it. And we are debiting the suspense account. The did, the should, the correction, guys, it helps, it does, it gives you some structure. And if you don't need it, that's fabulous. Be confident and go right for it. But if you're not sure and you you, you know you doubt yourself, um, I certainly do sometimes, that technique will help. Now task seven looks kind of overwhelming because we've got lots of tables we've got lots of boxes and instantly we kind of think well what on earth are we going to do it is nothing more complicated than balancing off the t account which is something you'll have done many times in terms of introduction to bookkeeping uh, transactions and then popping the balance carry down in the ledger account and then recording the balance in the trial balance so the bank account i'm going to add up my debits I don't my credits and I'm going to find the difference. So I'll do the bank account. So it's £347.25. Sorry, sorry, it's £3,000. Um, £3,477. Pounds of 3, I can't even get my words out. It's £3,047.25. I'll start again. Okay, that's a balance carry down on the debit side. But in your trial balance, it gets reported as a balance bought down. And it's on the opposite side. And all that means, guys, is I'm overdrawn in the bank. Can you work out the balance carried down for me in the VAT control? And then tell me whether it's a debit or credit in the trial balance. So work out the figure for the VAT control. But when you tell me it's a debit or credit, tell me it from the trial balance point of view. Excellent. Yeah, excellent, guys. I'll try and say this properly. So it's £3,646.10 and pence, and it's a balance bought down as a, a credit because I obviously owe HMRC. It's a balance carried down on the debit side. Guys, because I'm feeling generous, I'll do the discounts allowed. There's only one figure, so I think I can manage that just about. The balance carried down is a credit the balance bought down a debit because it's an expense and that makes sense. Can you do the last one for me, please, guys? The balance on the payables ledger control account. Tell me what the figure is and then tell me whether it's a balance as a debit or credit in the trial balance. From the debit or credit point of view, guys, in the trial balance, please.
Excellent, guys. Well done. Perfect. It certainly is. It's £6,343.20. And guys, it's a credit because it represents what my I owe my uh, suppliers, my liability. And the moment of truth, and again, confidence you've got the marks in the exam, the moment of truth, guys, do the debits and credits agree? Because they should, if we've done it right. And if they do, can you tell me what they agree on? So I'll just give you a moment. There's a few figures there, guys, and please feel free to double check it. You're under no pressure in terms of time. So what does the trial balance balance on? Assuming it does, assuming we've done it right. I've got one answer up. I've got two people that agree. Anyone else? <clears throat> Great. And it does. You're absolutely right, guys. But in the exam, we check that. It works. It balances. You know, it's another section of marks under our belt. And it, it's, again giving us confidence as we progress through that paper, that we, we're on the right track, we're collecting the marks as we go. The last task for this um, exam, this assessment, um, again, looks a little bit daunting because we've got a list of balances on the top left-hand side of the screen. The bottom left-hand side of the screen, you've got some journals, and then you've been given a partially completed trial balance. And what you need to do is you need to look at the journals and it affects, if you look at the journals, you can see it affects the purchases account and the discount received account. Those journals need to be updated to the original balances that you were given and popped into the trial balance. Now, some of you guys, you'll get your calculator, you'll instantly know what to do. Some of you, again, through confidence or sometimes even on the exam day, just through sheer nerves, will just be a little bit unsure. If you are, then draw a T account, draw a ledger account. So I've drawn up a purchases account and the balance brought down of £34,998.67. I've got from the uh, top left hand box, purchases were debit. The balance brought down has been put in as a debit. The template that gives me the journal information on the bottom left hand side of the screen shows me that I have debited purchases with £3,005.54. So pop that onto the debit side of your purchase account. Do as the question asks, guys. When you balance off the account, the balance carried down on that account, guys, will go onto the opposite side of the trial balance because remember it's the balance brought down that we see in the trial balance guys i'm going to give you a moment to work out what you think the new figure is for discounts received and you can do it just by a calculation method or by drawing yourself a ledger account but can you tell me what the new figure is for discounts received and whether it's a debit or credit when it goes into the trial balance please and i'll just give you a moment don't worry if you're not sure yeah just have a go So we were given an opening balance of 268.54. We've got to credit that with 17.58. So the balance brought down ultimately becomes becomes what? I 
I'll just give you a moment. Okay. Okay. We'll just wait for, for one more response and then we'll go through it. So the key is again, thinking about what that account actually is to start off with. Well, discounts received are a sundry income, aren't they? Um, so therefore, when we open the ledger account, we're going to have a balance brought down of 26854. It's a sundry income, it's a credit. You're told that the discounts received account should be credited with 17.58. I can work out the balance carried down and then of course it goes on to the opposite side of my trial balance. And again, this is where I'm going to sit here with everything crossed. Um, no problem, Jenny, no problem at all. Absolutely, you'll get a copy of the um, the, the recording tonight i hope you found it useful um, and thank you for joining um, i am almost done for the rest of you guys so um we're, we're, we're almost there um so guys this is where i'm going to sit there with everything crossed does my trial balance agree do my debits and credits agree and if they do on what figure please So this is proof that what we've done is right. We've amended two figures because we've had to put journals through. Did we do it correctly? If we did, the trial balance will agree. If we didn't, it will cause us to stop, rethink and relook at our figures. I'm very much liking Luke's figure. Yeah, I like that one. And ladies, yeah, absolutely. It does agree. And again, you know, I've collected another section of marks because my trial balance is working. And that's it from me tonight guys that sort of concludes tonight's session and also brings to a close the principles of book keeping controls and delivery i hope you found the three sessions extremely useful um, of course you've always got um your, your individual tutors but guys if there's anything you'd like to to raise with me either from tonight's session or any of the previous sessions and um, please don't hesitate to get in touch they're my contact details uh, and i'll always be happy to help you um the only other thing for me to say, guys, is you should now be well equipped to go through and complete all three assignments if you haven't already. Um, and also um, the, the, the mock assessments. And guys, we, you know, as your tutors, we look forward to getting those in and, and making sure that you're OK and, and then advising you then to go forward to the, the live assessment. So for me, guys, I just like to thank you for, for being with me tonight. I know some of you have been with me for all three sessions. Thank you ever so much for joining in, participating. It makes my life a lot easier and more pleasurable. And I hope you've enjoyed the sessions as much as I have. Thank you ever so much, guys. I really appreciate it. No, Kathy. No, no. You, you won't necessarily. You know, level. Um, th this level is about sort of your application of knowledge. Um, so you know, not not necessarily about regurgitating and um, definitions. They are in the, your learning resources, so you know you can refer to them. Um, but no, concentrate your efforts on the application of your, your knowledge rather than sort of reciting and learning by rote. If that makes sense. <laughs>
Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So the, the, there are other sessions that are planned um, to take place, uh, you know, that they're in progress as we speak uh, and you'll be notified about them in due course. So, yeah, I'm glad you found them useful and there's certainly every intention to continue them through the modules as well. Yeah, thanks, Cathy. You too. Take care. Yeah, thanks, Luke. Take care now. Bye all.